On that side. That's it. That's it. You can walk here like they can. They can't go more than this. Even if I'm the only Brazilian who comes here. So the settlers are living just here. In this area. You know, in, in, in some compounds, and they occupy the new house. Not only that, you see the green cable here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. They are stealing electricity from our own electricity. They occupy the new houses here, and they steal electricity from our own electricity. It means we pay for their electricity. We buy the electricity from an Israeli company because we are not allowed to have our own, you know, generation. Even renewable energy is completely restricted here. Then they steal it from us. They don't pay. And all this, all this started around the time of the second intifada. It started 1994, expanded ah. the second intifada. But the closure, the division, the segregation, segregation started 1994, 25th of February 1994. And the, and the settlers came here in 1978. Yeah, 60. Yeah, 60 Hotel. Yes, but they started permanently living in the city in 1979. Their, their, their presence is not approved by the Israeli government. We will walk now like this. We'll go out, walk into the city, down here, and you will come back by yourself from here. I tell this to the army. I can avoid all of them. But not as a normal citizen living here. Okay? Not as a normal woman going to her job or an old lady going to a doctor or visiting her relatives. You can avoid all of them. Empty areas, always you have somewhere to enter. Where there is a wall, a Chinese proverb, there is a hole. I disagree. There are holes. Okay? Around 100,000 Palestinian workers, they work in Israel illegally in spite of the war. I know how they get in. I got in even three weeks ago. Because I'm not allowed to go to Jerusalem, I can't get a permit, and I had to apply for American visa to go to the U.S. They, yeah, okay. And I sneaked in, but they arrested me at the uh, at the uh, American consulate or the American embassy at the, at the gate. Imagine that they have border police who arrested me from there. It was a big deal. So let's go. This is the Ibrahimi Mosque and the cave of the Mahbella. Okay, so the, the Ibrahimi Mosque here, the cave of the Patriarch or the cave of the Mahbella, as you want to say it. Mahbella means two caves upon each other. And the religious history says, religious history says that Abraham came from Egypt to bury his wife Sarah here. And many, many tombs are here. Me personally, I'm very critical. <laughs> Me, I don't, I don't believe it. You want to believe it, it's up to you. Okay? You can study more about the cave of the Machbella in Hebron, about if we have buried prophets or not. But many Muslims and a lot of Jews, they believe that we have buried, buried prophets here. We have uh, Sarah and, uh, and Abraham's. Uh, they have their own tombs. Tombs, yeah. tombs yes. And Rebecca and Isaac, Joseph. Uh, Yaakov are inside. Okay, I didn't see any 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 neutral history talking about that. But they they say it exists. About this building, they say that Herodos. It's not, it's, it's not Herodos even. It's not mentioned in any anywhere that who built this place. But they say that the architecture of this place looks like Herodos, the Herodian period. Okay, that's what they say. Okay. But it was around, it was a wall around the cave. And then it was, I think, a church, synagogue, and a mosque. And now it was a mosque. The main milestone was here in 1990. I, I like to talk about politics. But if you want me to do more, do more history, I can do. 
1994, 25th of February, it was Friday praying. I woke up on all mosques calling for people to go volunteer blood. We didn't know what was doing, what was happening that day, that morning. It was Ramadan. All people go to pray usually, even the not religious ones, they pray in Ramadan. So you have maybe 10 times more prayers in Ramadan than the normal days, if it's not more. And Baruch al-Dishtan, during a, a Jewish holiday, uh, where they hide, you know, I don't know the name of the holiday. Purim. Purim yes, in, in Purim. He went into the mosque with a lot of magazines, with the guns and bombs. He shot 29 Palestinians, he murdered them, hundreds were injured. And his anniversary is celebrated now as a hero for the settlers in Hebrew. Even they celebrate Igal Amir, who killed Rabin, the Israeli prime minister in 1995. So the result of the massacre now, to divide the mosque for two parts, 80% for the Muslims inside, 20% for the Jews. Outside the mosque, 100% for the Jews, only this road for the Muslims. That, that's what I care a lot. When I was a child, I, I was playing here and we had a, a small pool to swim. Not anymore. It's all closed. Only 10 days a year, it's either all open for the Muslims or all for the Jews in Jewish holidays or Muslim holidays. Okay? Can I ask you a question? What is that up there on top of the military post? It's just the ugliest thing you can see. Yes, they added it. They add a bad, uh, a bad uh, uh, extension here. They destroyed the architecture of the mosque. Not even if it's not a mosque, if it's a holy place. They destroyed the history by adding new stones, a new uh, room. Uh, UNESCO last year declared it as a world heritage, a Palestinian world heritage and, uh, and, and in danger. So it's in the world heritage list of the UNESCO. Unfortunately, they are changing a lot of realities here. Netanyahu came here, him and his wife Sarah, uh, during their election campaign. We became election objects for them. How many settlers live here now? You know, they say that, you know, it's between 600 to 800 settlers. No. This, yes, no. now. No. They say 1,000, but they are uh, students too, in the yeshiva. Yes. Yeah, so they say 1,000, 200, 300 students. So the, uh, the ones who are living here, they are a few hundreds. I, yeah. They are working to increase them, yes. But it's not easy, because it's... The Palestinians are so stubborn here. And how many Palestinians? 220,000. 220,000. In Hebron. In Hebron. In Hebron city. Yes, yes, yes. Hebron district is 700,000 ten. Yeah. The district is 700,000. The city is 220,000. 220. In the city, yes. It's a big city. Against 600, 800. Yes, between 600 to 800 settlers. Yes. Exactly. And how many soldiers? Yeah. About 3,000 soldiers? Thousands. To be accurate, thousands. Breaking the silence, I recommend that you go online and you read their yes. testimonies. Ex-soldiers served in Hebron. One of them says that I see settlers attacking Palestinians. They tell you, you are here only to protect the Jews. I was attacked many times by Israeli settlers and the soldier did nothing to stop them or arrest them or to help me. Because that's yeah. not his job. Yeah. We do advocacy to show the occupation out of Hebron, because this is all over West Bank, like that. But here it's very intense. You see it quickly, okay? You see it in two hours, three hours. You see the occupation. This is the occupation. It's not only in Hebron, okay? Is it getting less? The Palestinian population here, inside H2, in Hebron, yes. The area is targeted, the number of population is reducing. For example, my school, the number of students was reduced from 600 students to 260. Now, <laughs> settlers are living on the tops here. They throw everything back down without accountability. But if a Palestinian does something, he's 10 times accountable. So when they say that Palestinian, they have bad, violent people, yes, we are not angels. Are we saying that we are angels? No, we are not angels. We have fanatic, extreme Palestinians, but they are accountable for anything they do. Their society is accountable. We all accountable for anything they do. In the other hand, the settlers here, they do everything with full impunity. Why? Because they are under the Israeli civil law. 
and the Palestinian family who are living here are under the Israeli military law. Two families close to each other, and the soldier is watching us there. If I throw a stone now, he arrests me or shoots me or does anything according to what they tell him to do. But if I sit there and throw stones, he's not accountable. Oh, she's not accountable. That's, that is the situation. He's waving at us. Shalom. Yalla, let's go. Isa, yes. I'm very interested to buy something. If you want to do shopping, I said that we can give five minutes. Please, okay. try to support because sometimes we hardly do business and we wait for the groups to buy things from us. In Gaza Strip, they destroyed it, they killed so many Palestinians. They know about Gaza. They are, they are here today and in they, At the end, they call us that we are terrorists. We are unarmed people. We haven't got guns, machine guns, airplane to attack. What about your heart? Or to fight or to even fight. to defend ourselves. <laughs> Go on, Isa. What about your heart? My heart? Yes. What about it? It's a threat to them. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You know, listen to him now. And how, how come some are shut down and some are open? What is there just random? You know, the majority of the shops you saw open are only opening their shops as kind of protest and as a kind of uh, trying to resist the Israeli occupation. That's all. They don't do business. So the closure policy affected the customers. Jamal told you we don't see customers. The, it used to be so busy. I remember my father holding my arm not to lose me. It was, it was our Times Square here. So busy streets, so busy markets, so busy area, very rich. Now, it's the poorest in Hebron. It's the ghost town in Hebron. It's the closed city in Hebron. Are we still in H2? We are in H2, yes. There is H2, here is H2. But to reduce the number of Palestinian worshippers to go to the mosque, they are making it impossible for you to reach the mosque on time of the praying. And you suffer a lot to reach the mosque. You don't want to pass by metal detectors and, you know, smoothie soldiers, two checkpoints in a few meters. You pass here, then you pass in. Two times, a few meters. So that, that what we call it, closure policy to make the life harder and harder. So they reduce the number of Palestinians who are living in this part of the city. Uh -huh. right. Yes, please. We hear stories about children going to school through the checkpoints. Yes, this checkpoint in the morning, you are in queue. You know what hurts me? I, you know, the most hard arrest experience for me was 2013. I organized a protest to bring the attention of Obama, who visited here, the ex-American ex president. And I was arrested. And honestly, I was very happy to be arrested. Why? Because I was with Obama, and others were with Martin Luther King masks. And we wanted to bring the media attention. Okay? You can find it online. I was arrested. I was taken to the police station around 12.30, you know, midday. I reached the, the, the police station. I saw seven Palestinian children being held there since 7.30 in the morning. Not only that, they told me that the soldiers were outside the school where we have been, and they chose around 50 students and they put them in the, in the bus, and they took them near the, the, the police station, and they started inter interrogating the students six, seven, eight, ten, twelve, thirteen years old, who threw stones? Each one was saying that one did it. Why? Because they, they just want to go home. Mm -hmm. So they chose seven of them. When I reached there, the seven, one, the seven which the army chose to take the police station from the 50 who were detained before, they were from 7.30 without restrooms, without food, with handcuffed and blindfolded. Dead. That is completely illegal, you know. Children arrest is illegal and detention. That treatment in the police station is completely illegal. So I talked to the soldier who was guarding them. Please, they release their hands. Take off the, you know, the, 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 the ice cover. Take them to the restroom. He refused. I remember that I started shouting in the police station to bring all policemen to me. And they know me. I'm well known. I told the police officers, what are you doing? Restrooms, food. I'm not talking about releasing them. I'm talking that you treat them with respect. Respect their childhood. 
The policemen listened to me, okay? They gave them food, they released their hands, they sent them to the restroom, and it became four, five. The police officers left, and we stayed with the soldiers. They handcuffed them again, and five of them were taken to me to the detention center. It was midnight, imagine 7.30 to midnight, their families didn't know anything about them. The police investigator told them, say that you threw one stone and you go to see your mother. So when the children were going out from the, the interrogation, I was asking them, what did you say? I said that I threw one stone and till now I will not forget that when they started taking us away from the police station to the detention center, one of them started crying, he wanted his mother. And he wanted me to call his mother, but I was arrested too. You know what to do? I can speak, I can talk, I can shout, because I know my rights. But the child was crying to me to call his mother to cry to her. Not only that, we were taking in a van. And when they took us to Gosh uh, Atzion Detention Center, it's very dark. I know that all adults, they are afraid to be there. No one of, one of you here will, not, will be, you know, that courageous person not to be there. I know it by heart because I was arrested many times there, okay? When we reached, the, they started waking them up. The children thought that their families are waking them up. Then you see the child, see the soldier, and you know, suddenly jumping, crying, shouting, and terrified. And then so, dogs barking in an area where it's very, very dark. And they kept them outside. I was taking inside to the detention center because I'm an adult. And they were children. The, the detention center guards refused to receive them inside. They kept them outside waiting till the morning. Okay, we just passed a checkpoint in a normal day. Delaying you, humiliating you, joking. That is the life here, when you have a checkpoint just outside your house. It's not between two cities, it's not between two countries. It's between your house and the grocery shop. It's between your house and the school. Between your house and the market. Okay, I was very happy to, to meet you. If you want any more information, any more questions, I am ready to answer. Uh, Angelica has my contacts, but if not, put Google my name and you will find my Twitter, my Facebook, my Instagram. Isa Amro, I-S-S-A, Isa Amro, A-M-R-O.